Hi, morning guys. So great to be back here and to minister to you this morning. Um, I, here in Cape Town, it's rainy today. Uh, what a nice week. It's just before uh, we're going to celebrate on Sunday. We're celebrating our uh, Pentecost and I'm so excited about it. And my whole message this morning is just leading up to that. And But also this morning I want to speak to you from my heart. Um, and I believe that this is going to be a message. It might bring some inner healing. It might bring some relief or or uh, something to some people, you know, because I believe that God is a God of deliverance. God is a God of a new thing. And God wants to do something new in your life. And I mean, and so many times we are so stuck on the things of the past that we cannot step into what is new. You know, you can't live your life looking in the rearview mirror. You can't. Um, look forward. Paul says, I forget what is behind me and I stretch towards what is ahead. But so many of us, and I mean, in our country, we are living in a time where we uh, still focused on the past. So many people in our country today are still focused on the past. They're still looking at the past. And that's why the country doesn't go forward. So many times in our lives, we, we have things that happened in the past and it could be generations ago. Maybe we don't even know about what happened, you know, but those things have been affecting our lives. And I'm not talking about bloodline curses and stuff like that. I'm not so much into that. I believe there are stuff like that. The Bible says the curse is up uh, for, uh, rests up to the third and the fourth generation. But the blessing of the Lord goes to a thousand generations, you know, of them that love him. And I believe that we are not of those that are under curses because we are we stepped into the protection of God. We're under the blood of Jesus. We move from the one bloodline family to the another, and that is the family of God. So we're not under that curse anymore, under a curse when we are believers. But maybe this morning you're sitting here and you're not a believer yet, or you don't really believe in Jesus, and, and you're listening to this video. And this morning I want to speak to you, and, and some of the believers as well, you know, because many times what we see as a curse is actually a mindset. It's a way of thinking. It's a way that we were trained to think by our parents, we, a way we were trained to think by the generations before us, uh, the generations following in the footsteps of their fathers. And so many times that is seen as a bloodline curse, but it's actually a pattern. And the Bible says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that we need to change our mind, to change our thoughts. But as a sinner and as an unbeliever, it's difficult to do that because you carry the same spirit, that hurt spirit, that sinful spirit, that spirit that has been um, adopted over generations, you know. But when you become a child of God, then you step, you are born again, you receive a new spirit. You are a new person in Christ Jesus. The old has gone, the new has come. There's something new that happens within you. You are filled with the Spirit of God. And that Spirit comes in you and it renews your mind. It renews your heart. It renews your being. It renews your blood. It brings you into a new family. Under a new blessing. Uh, under a covenant, you know. And it's so powerful. And I don't have time to go into all that. But it brings you into a new family. And so many times... People are living their lives in the rear view mirror. They are living on things that happened in the past. They still have the same old mindsets, same old thoughts. And those are the things that are holding them back, that are robbing them, and that are stealing from them. And the enemy will use that in your life because the Bible says he's a thief. He's come to steal and kill and destroy. And he will use that in your life to rob you of the purpose and the plan and the things that God has for you. But also in that, with God, all things work together for them who loves Him. God can use those things and He can bring forth a message. He can bring something into your life that will be life-changing to others. You know, and I, I believe that God wants to speak to us this morning. And, um, and I want to speak to you this morning about the woman at the well. There's so much in this word. Uh, I believe that a lot of people haven't seen or uh, understand about the scripture. And it also leads up to the Holy Spirit and the work of the Spirit. But before I waste any more time, I don't have a title as, much as yet. But, uh, you know, I believe that it's coming into that new season. Come into your new season. You know, and this morning I want to speak to you about that. The Bible says um, that in, Luke, in John, John chapter 4, 
and verse 1. I'm just going to dive into the word and we're just going to see how it goes. I don't know if I'll be able to do everything in one session. So the Bible says, uh, the, the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, right in the beginning, we see there's a, there's a, a kind of a comparison with the Pharisees and they comparing Jesus and, and John the Baptist. And, uh, you know, and, and that's what the church always does. It's always like leaders are comparing leaders with leaders and pastors with pastors and so on. You know, and, and that, that it's such a sad thing so many times because everybody is different. You can't compare people with other people. Everyone's got a different message. Everyone's got something else that they are bringing to the table. And so many times our judgment can influence people. So they're not themselves because they try and, you know, uh, I know how it is when you do stuff and people kind of tease you and, and make jokes about uh, what you're doing and so on. And it affects you and it kind of help, wants you to change your, your way you're doing things because you want to fit in or whatever. You know, and God hasn't called us to fit in but to stand out. And we see with Jesus, yeah, they start baptizing him, uh, uh, comparing him with John and saying that he is baptizing more people than John did and so on. And, 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 um, but it wasn't Jesus that was baptizing him. The Bible said it was his disciples doing that. But the Bible says when Jesus learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. When he heard that this is what they're doing, he, the Bible says he, when he learned of this, he left Judea. He went away from Judea and he went back to Galilee. You see, Jesus never wanted to be caught in the comparison and in the church, this church against that church and stuff like that. You know, uh, he left that. He said, no, I'm not going to be compared. I'm not going to get into this whole thing. I'm going to step out of it. And there's a place where I need to be. Because in the next verse, we see now he had to go through Samaria. The other, uh, um, another Bible says he needed to go through Samaria in verse 4. You know, so Jesus wasn't uh, going to be held up by comparisons and all these kinds of things. He always had a mission. He always had somewhere where he needed to be. He always, he was always listening to the Spirit. He was always led by the Spirit. And uh, Jesus' ministry for three, uh, three and a half years, I don't know how long it was, he had to do whatever he could. So there was a purpose to him. There was a purpose to his life. There was an assignment on his life that he wanted to fulfill. He didn't want to waste time, you know. And so many times we have a lot of time uh, in our ministries that we can waste but Jesus was determined he had to do the Bible says he, he had to go through Samaria now Samaria um, in those days it was a it was kind of a half-breed nation where uh, they weren't completely Jews and they were kind of Midianites they were in between these uh, people and 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 the they they, the, there was a thing that happened in their past that was affecting their relationship. The Jews always looked down on them. They saw them as a half-breed. They, they didn't see them as pure and, and all these kinds of things. But I just want to get back to that. In Genesis chapter 33, it actually talks about um, this whole story and what happened in this place. And I believe that Jesus went there because there was healing needed. Uh, with these Samaritans in, in Sekar. There was healing needed in, in this nation because they came through so much and, and there was effects of the things that happened in their past upon their lives and Jesus had to go through there because he, he had to bring this healing. You know, and that's what I love about Jesus. He never leaves any stone unturned. He, he tried to reach everything and reach everybody he tried to reach the rich, he tried to reach the poor, he tried to reach everyone. And even in this case, he went to the Samaritans, which were a rejected race, a race that people didn't really like. And we thank God for that because it also talks about us today. We are the Gentiles, we're not Jews, but he came to us and he even redeemed us from the curse of the law. He redeemed us from our past. He, he, he included us. Now, let's just look at this quickly. I had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sekar. Now, Sekar, the name Sekar uh, means drunkenness and falsehood. 
Now Sekar, the Bible says, was near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat by the well. It was about the sixth hour. So we see here uh, that Jesus comes to this town, and uh, he went to this well, and the Bible said Jacob's well was there. Now a well is always a place where uh, people in those days, they met there. Uh, it was a place of nourishment, a place that gave a new life in the area. Usually a town was built around a well. And we know that Jacob dug wells wherever he went. And these were one of the wells that Jacob dug. And from there, this town emerged and grew called Sekar. And um, the, the, by the Bible says the name Sekar means drunkenness and falsehood. So this place that was supposed to bring life, that was supposed uh, that created a community this place that brought people together that's where m men met women when they came to draw water and and we see it with sarah and and and, and in the old testament and and there were so many things that happened at a well men met women people came together they said i'll meet you at the well and then we can discuss this or whatever you know so there were so many things and then from there the life came and I always see this kind of as the church a place where there's supposed to be life a place that uh, um, a, a town is built around a community is built around a place that brings uh, change a pray, place that that when people can meet one another families can meet uh, destinies are connected uh, bonds are formed you know so it's powerful. Families are connected. It's a powerful place when you look at this. But in this case, the Bible says that Sekar, which means falsehood and drunkenness, in this town that was supposed, now the, this place was, first of all, it was called Shechem. If we look at Genesis 33, the place was called Shechem. And if you look at the history of the story, there was, uh, Jacob had a daughter, her name was Dina. I don't know how to pronounce it, Diana, and um, she, they stayed there, and she went into the town of Shechem um, uh, to, to go and visit the woman of Shechem to meet them and to see them and so on, and so she went into this time and then into this town, and then Shechem, which was the son of, uh, uh, I can't remember his name, Hona or something, and then he came into this town, uh, she went to the girls, and, and then this Shechem guy, he saw her, and immediately he fell in love with her, and he actually took her, he slept with her, he actually raped her, um, that's how they see it, but he just loved her, from the moment he saw her, he just loved her. Now, I don't know what they, I, I read some commentaries, I don't know if it was their kind of tradition or something, that they were by, very open, they weren't like, uh, the Jews very strict on their rules and virgins and so on. So, but he took this woman and he actually raped her. But then he went to his father and he said he loves this woman. His heart is set on her. And will he not go to Jacob and discuss it with him and ask him if he cannot marry this girl? And so uh, his father went to Jacob and he spoke to him and, uh, and, and he told him what happened. And then um, Jacob kept it quiet, and then his sons came home. And uh, when they came home, he told them what happened. Uh, I just want to turn back to that place in Genesis. He came there, and he, he went back there. And, and when he, he told his sons what happened, uh, they were actually very angry. They couldn't believe that he has done that. And um, they decided, but they're not going to leave it like that. They're going to do something about it. And we see that two of his sons went and they, um, they said to, when they spoke about it, they said, okay, on one condition, he can marry her on one condition. And that is if they take, uh, all their men must be circumcised like the Jews were. And if they, if they do that, then they can intermarry and they will take their woman and they can take their woman. And, and, and they can, uh, the father actually said, then you can, uh, you, we can, uh, do trade and whatever, and you can inquire land here yeah, and whatever. So it was a good trade deal, which they usually did in those days. And um, but Jacob's sons decided, but this is not what they are going to do. They are going to use this situation. But we also see in the story. You can go and read it in Genesis 33, 
where, where um, uh, uh, this, this father of, of uh, Shechem, he also decided that, uh, well, if we can marry them, we can take their riches. So there was a little bit of deceit in his heart about this whole thing because they could kind of take and, and, and uh, intermarry with the Israelites and take their wealth because Abraham, Jacob was very wealthy. And in the same way, uh, uh, the sons of Jacob deceived them. He said, no, if you can be uh, all be circumcised, then you like us, and then we can intermarry. And so uh, they went and they circumcised all the men. They agreed. They said, it's fine. So they circumcised all the men. And then they wait till the third day. That was usually when infection came and a bit of a fever came on the men who were circumcised. And on the third day, two of uh, Jacob's son went in there and they killed all the men in that town, which was a very bad thing to do. They killed all the men, the sons, the, 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 the men that was in that town, they killed them. So all these women were left. And then they took all the women, they took all the spoils, they took everything. And they, uh, they took it with them because Jacob, at that point, Jacob didn't know. And when he found out, he said, what have you done? You brought reproach against me with the Midians and all these other uh, uh, nations around us. We'll have to move. So they moved away. But the Bible says that the fear of the Lord came over all the nations around them and they didn't attack them. So God saved them from this whole situation. But now in this whole situation, there was so much that happened. It was unfair. This, this, this Shechem guy loved, um, uh, uh, what's her name again? He loved this girl and uh, Diana, he loved her and he wanted to, to marry her. You know, he knew that he did was wrong. He loved her. He, the Bible actually said he spoke softly to her. So he kind of um, uh, misled her and whatever and got, got her into sleeping with him. But we see that this whole thing brought this murder where he, uh, Jacob's son went and they killed them all and they murdered them and they did this great unrighteous thing to these people but at the same time what uh, what uh, Shechem's did was also wrong you know so it's an in-between story it's an in-between thing and this is what caused the the, the uh, tension between the Samaritans and the Jews there was also always this history that was hanging in the air. There was this history of what happened in Shechem that was hanging in the air. Now the name Shechem actually means straight back. It means to shoulders back and straight back. That is what the word Shechem means. This was the son of, of, of the main guy in the town. So there was a pride on him. He walked straight back. There was something about him. He carried himself well, you know. And I believe that that is what it's saying. But because of this thing that happened, because of this unrighteousness done on both sides and against one another, it became a place of falsehood and drunkenness. The name changed to Sekar, a place of falsehood and drunkenness. You see, whenever there is something done to a nation or done to a, a race or done to a family, there's also always a, a kind of a result where people are drinking. They try... They, try to be who they are not they're always trying to be more than what they are you know it's like a falsehood it's not a realness it's not a, um, a authentic person it's it's kind of they lose their identity they lose their character and we see with this whole nation the Samaritans they lost their identity were they Jews or were they Samaritans or what, what you know they they lost their identity and with that whole thing all these other problems came they started drinking and we see in the life of this woman she had five husbands we'll see later on she had five husbands and the one she was living with was not a husband so she could never commit um, we see that the Jews in, 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 in Genesis they took all the women with them and I believe some of them came back to their town and they had to find husbands they had to marry other men uh, you know and stuff like that from other uh, uh, towns or other places and another race and and to form their own thing and the Jews that took them away as slaves or took them away as wives they also slept with them so that's why they were this mixed race but there was always this identity crisis this hurt this this feeling of things and and because of that and I'm, I'm maybe they forgot maybe they didn't worry about it but because of what was done 
they, they, their children grew up not really knowing their fathers. Their children grew up not really knowing their inheritance as a family. They uh, were, were half-breed to the Jews, so they lost their identity. And with that came all this drunkenness and drinking and trying to be something they're not. And sometimes they want to be like the Jews, and sometimes they want to be like the... The, uh, 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 like the Midianites and they kind of fit in where they want it, you know. And I know in our country and then with all of us as Gentiles, we all kind of, I'm Irish, Afrikaans, you know, um, so, and there are many nations, yeah, people in our country is com coming from different backgrounds and so on. But with this whole thing, and I'm, I'm, maybe I'm wasting a bit of time on this, but we just see that this place that was supposed to be straight back, a place where they would have been proud of themselves, being who they are, know what they are, knowing their place, has turned into a place called Sekar, which means falsehood and drunkenness, which is so sad. And we see that the Bible says that Jacob's well was there. And this woman, Jesus had to go to this town because I believe that Jesus felt in his heart, I must go and make this wrong right. Jesus went there, he had to go there, because he had to bring the gospel to the Samaritans. He, he didn't want to just keep it for the Jews, he had to bring it to the Samaritans. And that's why he had to go there. So it was a bigger thing than just the normal. And when we look at the story, we can see that the Samaritans were waiting for Jesus. They were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. They were waiting for this change to come, for them to be liberated from this thing that they were in. So we see the Bible says, uh, then Jesus went and he tired as he was from the journey. He sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. So he went to this well and he sat there. And then this woman came. The Bible says, when a Samaritan woman, verse 17, when, the, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So here we see this woman, she was still carrying this wound. She was still carrying the spirit of rejection. She was still carrying this feeling of, I'm not good enough. Um, we don't really talk to the, they don't really talk to us. We kind of reject it, you know. So she was still carrying this thing. Uh, after how many years? That This happened in Genesis and we're already in John. It's like 600 years later or something, you know, many years later. So we see here these uh, people are and this woman still carries this thing because there was a resistance built between these races. And, 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 and it's so sad. But how Jesus came and he broke through that thing. He had to work through it. So because this woman comes and Jesus said to her, um, give me a drink of water. And she says, no, um, uh, how is it that you ask me for a drink of water? Because the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. I think uh, it says here in the commentaries at the bottom of my Bible, they didn't use the same pots or cups or spoons or utensils, you know. So they kind of, there was a, racial divide between them which was so difficult but Jesus worked through this thing you know sometimes we we come into situations with people that has got hurts in their hearts and they've got hurts because of things that happened in the past and in our country is an example of that it's so clear with our races in our country in South Africa there's so much hurt between these races. There's so much uh, feelings uh, uh, where the one feels it's wrong and the other one feels it wrong and everyone is kind of blaming one another. And all these issues are, uh, all these things are creating so many issues in our country and that's why our country can't go forward. That's why we can't break forward. That's why and in our lives, uh, to bring it to a personal level, so many times we have these issues that has happened in the past but it hinders us from breaking through because we have these mindsets or old ideas or things that we were going through and it's busy uh, binding us and robbing us of our future. And we see with this woman, Jesus comes to her and he asks her for water. She says, no, but uh, I'm a Samaritan and Jews do not associate with Samaritans. She had this hurt in her. 
But the Bible says in verse 10, Then Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So now we see Jesus, this woman comes, she says, you're a Jew, you ask me for water. And she's kind of um, not happy and a bit surprised that he should do that. And then Jesus comes and he speaks to her in a spiritual manner. He talks to her about the living water. If you knew the gift of God, and that is the Holy Spirit, if you knew the gift of God, you would have asked me, uh, 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 you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She, he says to her that if you knew the gift, you would have asked me and I would have given you living water. So Jesus takes this conversation immediately, he takes it to the spiritual. He talks about spiritual things. But because this woman is so bound up in her natural, in the natural things, the things that has been happening in her life, uh, she's been in a relationship, the sixth relationship, uh, she's so caught up in the natural. You know, she's so caught up in the circumstances. She's so caught up in trying to find a good husband, trying to find someone. She's sit sitting with this identity crisis. She's sitting with all these feelings of hurt and all these things. Why has this happened to me and that happened to me? And and it's because of the Jews and, and maybe they recited, you know, because of that, that what happened those time in that time at Shechem. Now it's Sekar and we have all these feelings these men are so false you know you think it's a good man and then it's a bad guy i mean you girls how many guys have you met and you think it's a good guy and then you want to marry him but he never comes to ask you to marry him he never comes to the place where he makes a commitment he just moves on to the next guy and sometimes with guys they experience this with the girls you know so it's false it's not real but jesus comes and he speaks to this woman he sees that she struggled but he works through that the Bible says he said to her, uh, Sir, the woman said, first of all, he starts speaking to her spiritually and she answers him, but notes how she answers him. She answers him in the flesh again. So she does, she's not catching on that if, he, he, if she knew who he was speaking to him, he, she would have asked him for living water and he would have given it to her. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing, verse 11, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and his herds? So yes, she answers him. He's talking about spiritual things. He said, I will give you living water and you won't have to come here to draw again. And this woman said, Lord, if uh, you have nothing to draw with. So she only sees the physical. She sees the natural. Today, as, as Christians, we sometimes want to speak to people about spiritual stuff, but they are focused on the natural. They are so focused on uh, the life that they've been living. They're so focused on the things that they, where they come from. And we sometimes have to go and get them there where they are and bring them into the spiritual. So we see here, uh, the woman was... She, her mind was focused on you have nothing to draw with uh, the well is deep and um, uh, he says are you greater than Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as, as did his sons and his flocks and his herds all these things are you greater than that and the Bible says and Jesus answered everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again but whoever drinks the water and that water he's talking about the Holy Spirit I give him will never thirst Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And we are entering uh, the time, we are, we, we're on Sunday, we're going to have uh, our uh, Pentecost week. And here Jesus comes and he says, this spirit, this water that I want to give you is living water. It will spring from within you. Uh, it will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You know. So Jesus is talking spiritual again to this woman. But the woman is still focused on the natural. You know, it's so funny sometimes, you know, so focused on the natural. And I think sometimes as believers as well, you know, you have to keep on pushing the things of the spirit because people are not always open to understand or to grasp the things of the spirit. You need to keep on pushing the things of the spirit 
uh, so that people can work through the natural, that which I, and, and the Holy Spirit will come and He will speak into the hearts of people. He will touch people. So we see here in verse 15, the woman said to Him, again we see her in the natural, in the fresh. The woman said to Him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get, get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So this woman, she says, so that I can come here and don't have to draw water on the natural. She's just focused on the natural. But now Jesus comes and he shifts this whole message. And this is what I want to tell you this morning. You know, Jesus comes and he changes it. He comes and he starts operating in the spirit. Now he's talking to her about spiritual things, but she doesn't understand it. He talks about her, about the Father, and he talks about the water and living water, but she doesn't understand it. Because it's not on a level, it's not her life, it's not it's something that she hasn't grasped, you know. But then Jesus comes and he moves into the spirit and he starts ministering to her life, into her life by a word of wisdom. Now a word of wisdom and I'm going to be doing, uh, in next week I'm going to be doing the gifts of the spirit. And a word of wisdom is when you see something in, in the, uh, in the uh, future, and you speak about something in the future, but a word of knowledge is when you see something in the past that God reveals to you or something that is happening now. Now, Jesus comes and he starts working with the gifts of the Spirit. He's operating in the gift of the word of, of, of knowledge. So he comes to her and he says, he told her, go call your husband and come back. So Jesus comes into her Rehalem, her life, into her the area where she, where she is, you know, and sometimes for us as children of God to be relevant in the lives of people, we need to be able to flow in the spirit, but on the level where people's lives are. And here God gave this gift. Jesus is using this gift, the gift that God has given us, this word of knowledge to speak directly into her life, to start penetrating her life so that she can come to the place of understanding but this is not natural. This is supernatural. You know, and, and they've heard the gospel when you look at this thing. They know that there was a Messiah coming. They were expecting these things. But she was so caught up in the natural, she couldn't move into the supernatural. But Jesus comes and he starts introducing the supernatural anointing. He starts introducing this, this, this gift of a word of knowledge and the pro prophecy and stuff that comes from that. So he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And then Jesus comes and he speaks directly to her. He says, Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. <laughs> so Jesus had to work through this flesh into the spirit. And he starts speaking to this woman, he says to her, and he gives her this word of knowledge. He tells her something about herself that only she knows, or her town knows. But he tells her something about herself that she knew that he didn't know. And immediately she moves from the flesh into the spirit. Immediately she comes onto the same page because the gift released her from the natural and brought her into the spiritual. And I want to tell you, the gift of the Spirit is so powerful. And we're going to look at it next week. The gifts of the Spirit are so powerful. And God has given us these gifts to minister to people, to, to move them from the natural into the supernatural, to bring them to a place to, where they know there is something, uh, there's something about the spiritual realm. But we must draw them into that realm for them to understand the fullness of God. So the Bible says, um, uh, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. So immediately she starts realizing, but he's a prophet. Immediately she recognizes him as a man of God. So many times we as children of God walk around everywhere we go as Christians, but nobody knows we're Christians. Uh, nobody knows that we are filled with the Spirit. Nobody knows that we are anointed. We are pastors. We are ministers of the gospel. You know, and, 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 and without the gifts, they will never know that. But because Jesus used the gift immediately, this woman said, I, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain and suddenly you hear this woman, she starts speaking about spiritual things. She starts speaking about worship. She starts speaking about these things. 
Sir, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So she had a heart of worship. She wanted to do that, but she was so caught up in the sinful life. You know, so you get so many people, they talk about the things of God, but their lives doesn't demonstrate it. And it's because they are so caught up in the natural. But Jesus brings this woman into the supernatural, into the, the, the spiritual things, so that she comes to understand, and which is actually the reality of where her life is. You know, the reality of your life is not in the natural sometimes. It's in the spirit. Because in your spirit, there are things that's happening that's hindering you from a breakthrough in your life in the natural. So we see, yeah, she talks to him about worship and so on. And then verse 21, Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you, you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. So yeah, he brings her into this thing. Salvation comes from the Jews. It started with him. He knew that he was the one that's going to bring that salvation. And he says, and there's going to come a time where you will not worship on this mountain or that mountain. But he continues and he said, uh, yet a time is coming and has now come. And I believe even with this whole COVID-19 and this lockdown thing, I believe a time has now come. People are understanding that there's a line drawn in the world. And I always talk about this. There's a, a, a dividing line drawn between good and evil. He says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and, he, and, and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and truth. And I believe there's a shift coming. God is busy changing our worship. And I, I, last night I was listening to uh, Elevation and, uh, Church and uh, those guys were worshiping. And it's so powerful. You know, there's a spirit of worship coming into the earth. He said, but the time is coming when those who worship me will worship me in spirit and truth. And I want to encourage you, church, that we must move away from the falsehood and the drunkenness or trying to be something that we're not, trying to find our identity and move into the spirit where we start worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And the Bible says those are the worshipers the Father seeks. You know, it's a deep calling unto deep, heart unto heart worship. God is spirit and those worshipers must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You can't worship God from the flesh. So many people try and worship God in the flesh with beautiful songs and the nice instruments and maybe the lights and what, and it's fleshly. But God is seeking worshipers that will seek and worship Him in spirit and in truth. And I'm not saying those things are wrong. Lights are powerful. Music is powerful. But when it's anointed and when the Spirit of God is in it, you can easily know when it's anointed and the Spirit and the presence of God is on it or when it's just technical and it's just talent, you know. So you can see it. But God is Spirit and His worshipers must worship Him in spirit and truth. So Jesus brings this woman and He tells her this. The woman said, I know the, the, that Messiah called Christ is coming. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. <laughs> there was an expectation in her heart. I'm telling you, the world is expecting something to happen. They are expecting God. The Bible says uh, that she said this to Jesus. And the Bible says in verse 26, Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am He. You know, I believe that we are living in a day where people are so caught up in the natural. And as believers, we need to step into the supernatural. We need to step into the gifts. We need to step into the anointing of God. We need to fast and pray. We need to increase in the spirit. So that when we speak to people, we can bring them from the natural to the supernatural. And then bring them into a place where release will come. The Bible says... Uh, Jesus went and he, uh, his disciples returned and so on. Uh, um, uh, uh, and they asked him, what was he eating? He said, no, I have food to eat that you don't know of. He ate from the word, uh, the things of God. And he talks about that. And then he sends this woman. Uh, this woman runs into the town. You know, Jesus touched her first. And then 
she came to the place where she re she knew that God revealed her life, uh, her past, or whatever. And it wasn't just for her that Jesus went there, and and therefore in her heart there was such an excitement that she went into a town, and she started telling him, "Come and see. There's a man that told me everything in my life." You know, so the gift of God, actually the gift of the Holy Spirit, opened this whole door for the ministry to this whole uh, town. And so this woman runs, and she's like the first evangelist, she runs, and she tells them, come and see, there's a man that told me my whole life. And so the whole town comes, and they meet Jesus, and Jesus went into the town, and he stayed there for two or three days, and he ministered to them. But what's beautiful, Jesus went into that town and he brought healing. I believe he brought healing and deliverance to that town. Not just physical, not just um, uh, 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 talking to them, but a spiritual healing. He came into that town as the Messiah and he changed their whole way of life. He changed them. He introduced himself. They knew that he was the Messiah. They knew at that point he was the one that they were waiting for. They knew at that point everything about him. And they as a, as a nation started following Jesus because of this, that what happened in Samaria. They started following him. And they, they logged onto his Facebook page and his YouTube page and his Instagram page. And they followed him and they went with him wherever he went. Even unto the cross where he died and he opened the door for everyone to come in with a curtain tore in two and the presence of God came and he filled everyone with the Holy Spirit. You know, and they moved into this new dimension where they didn't have to be locked up in their past, but they could step into that future and into their future. And this morning I want to encourage you. I only have a few minutes left and I want to encourage you this morning. Church of God, maybe you are sitting here this morning and you are caught up in the natural. You are so caught up in, especially in this time with this whole COVID-19. You know, so many of us are just looking at the natural. You're looking at your job that you lost. You're looking at, at uh, the unfairness that happened to you. You didn't get all your pay. You're looking at all the things in the natural that is happening to you, you know, and uh, that has happened to you. And maybe you come from a long life. I mean, we had a woman in our church that uh, she she was struggling. She came through a divorce. She came through so many things and she just got back on her feet again. And then this whole COVID-19 struck and she lost everything again. She lost her work and went through so many difficult things and went through so many things. But God has given her her work back. You know, and so many times we are stuck in the natural. We stuck in the everyday. We stuck in the circumstances around us. Even for me, you know, sometimes we get so easily caught up in the natural. I had to go and spray a truck last week and a week before. And it just brought me out of the spiritual things and into the natural and into, oh, I need to make money and I need to get more work and whatever. And it brings you out of that. And I'm not, you know, I'm not immune to that. But as a spiritual man, I can go and I can say, Lord, I know this is there. I see these things. But yet I decide to trust in you. Yet I'm going to rely on you. Yet I put my faith in you. I see those things that are not as though they are. I see the blessing of the Lord is on my life. I believe that you're going to come through for me. And in the spirit, I start speaking the life. I start speaking the things that I want to see. I start speaking those things. I start seeing those things. And as I do it, the spiritual realm starts moving. And it starts operating. The Bible says he gives his angels command concerning you. And as you declare it and as you speak it in a spiritual realm, angels are moving. Stuff is happening on your behalf. You know, and I want to encourage you this morning. Get out of the natural mind. Get out of the natural fear. Get out of the natural uh, worries and so on. The Bible says do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink. Do not worry about tomorrow. Every day will take care of itself. You know, and if you can step into that spiritual truth of not worrying about tomorrow and knowing that God will take care of tomorrow, I must just live for today, trust Him for today, pray, seek Him. You know, and our lives shouldn't be based around just praying all the time in fear. Our lives should be based around worshiping in spirit and in truth, praising God, loving Him. 
You know, no matter what the circumstances are around us, we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. We mustn't come with tradition and religion and comparing like they were comparing Jesus with John and all these kinds of things. Oh, this guy is better than that. No, forget about that. Get into the spirit, spirit and start seeking the Lord. And then God will come with words and wisdom and knowledge. And, and as believers, we should be so rich of the spiritual things. We should be speaking words of wisdom into people's lives. Words of knowledge, prophecy. We should be praying for the sick. We should be casting out demons. We should be doing all these kinds of things. Having gifts of faith where you have faith that God's going to come through. No matter what, what, where God adds His faith to your faith. And you get the supernatural faith. I'm telling you, we've got these gifts. And, and God wants to bring us as the church back into this place. And I want to encourage you this morning, church. Get back to the place where God can use you. This morning... I want to first of all pray for every believer that has been caught up in the natural. And then I want to make an altar call for non-believers to give their lives to the Lord. First of all, let's just pray for every believer. Father, right now I pray for every child of God. Like this woman, she knew that there was something. But she couldn't grasp it because she was caught up in the natural, Father. Caught up in everyday circumstances. Father, and I pray today for your church, Father. All over the world that's listening to this video, Father, I pray this morning that you will release them. Bring them out of that place where they are so focused on the natural, so focused on the normal, Father God. Father, so focused on the things that are happening in their lives and even past things and generational things and mindsets, Father, that they can't break with. But Lord, I thank you this morning that you, Jesus Christ, you have come. You've paid the price on that cross. You've given us your Holy Spirit and you poured out your Holy Spirit on the earth. And today we have your Spirit and by your Spirit all things are possible. In your, in, by your Spirit we are led into all truth. By your Spirit we can see the truth. We will know the truth and the truth will set us free. So th therefore Father I ask you right now. Holy Spirit come and indwell us. Come and live in us. Come and make God real to us because you are our helper, our friend, the one who comes alongside. And we welcome you into our lives right now. Help us to move out of the natural and to start seeing things in the spirit, declaring it in the spirit. And it will come in fulfillment in the natural. It will happen the way we see it. If we say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea and do not doubt in our hearts, but believe that what we say, it will come to pass, Lord. And I thank you, Father, that today people are taking up their faith and they are breaking through fear and worry. They are breaking through um, the, the way now in their lives they are really entering back into the world with this uh, uh, lockdown uh, being eased up. Reality is coming back to them. Even for me, Father, reality is coming back. Now we, the pressure is coming back. It's coming on again. But Lord, I thank you that we are, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit that we will overcome the works of the enemy. And Father, right now, if there's anyone here and you need Jesus in your life, I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you want to say, Trevor, I am not a spiritual man. I don't know the things of God, but I want to know it. I want to step into that. I want Jesus to come into my life. And change it. I'm so tired of my past. I'm so tired of the things that I've come through. I'm so tired of the life I've been living. I want a new life. I want something to change. Today I'm giving you the key. The keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I'm giving you the key. The key of faith. The key of salvation. I'm giving you this key today. And if you say, Pastor Trevor, pray for me. I need Jesus in my life. I want you to pray this prayer after me. Just right now, wherever you are, say this. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I ask you right now, Father God, that you will touch me, that you will heal me, that you will restore me, Father. But pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you, come into my life. Wash me in your blood. Forgive me. I know that I am a sinner. But I believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross. And I ask you, forgive me my sin. 
and I accept him I declare today that he is the Son of God he died on that cross for me and I accept him into my life as my Lord and Savior right now and he brings me out of darkness into light in the name of Jesus amen amen right now if you prayed that prayer God has come and he has changed your heart he's changed your life and right now start expecting the Holy Spirit the Bible says desire spiritual gifts desire these things desire the things of the Spirit and on Sunday we're gonna have a, a service and I want to invite you to come and join us Sunday morning uh, 9 30 come and join us we're gonna be ministering on the Holy Spirit and I'm gonna be praying for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit so come uh, on Sunday morning join us live on Facebook join us live on Fa Facebook on his heart ministries um, you will see there's an eagle and his heart ministry standing there an eagle that flies over the water and catches a fish beautiful photo um, and I want you to join us on Sunday morning at 9 30 and, and come and join us in that service and I believe that God's gonna take you deeper and further and next week we're opening up our church again we're so excited about that and we want to invite you to come to our church at uh, the B.I. Montessori, it's near Stodals here in Belleville, Cape Town. Uh, to come there, if you're in the area, come there, it's near Stodals. The B.I. Montessori, you can just look it up on your GPS and God will touch you. So we, we love you, we, we thank you for listening and may God bless you. Enjoy your day. Bye.